This is the ID card when uh, all everybody living in Holland had to come and be registered. Everybody after the German occup occupied Holland. And uh, this became then your ID card. Uh, as you notice, uh, I was fingerprinted. I was only at that time 19 years old. Never did anything wrong to anybody. I was fingerprinted. I had to bring a uh, passport picture. Mm -hmm. And they put that on. And as you notice, there is a J on the bottom and a J on the top. Jewish people had a ID card with a J on it, so when they were stopped on the street by the SS, Gestapo, whoever stopped them and they had to produce this ID card that they knew that you were a Jew. Uh, in, in the middle, you, that stamp that you see is what I was talking to you about when I told you that uh, this would give me uh, the permission of uh, a permit that I didn't have to go to the concentration camp. In German it says, the bearer of this ID card is to later date exempt of going to one of these concentration camps. And as a matter of fact, as time went on, uh, I found out that for two and a half years I was exempt of going to one of these concentration camps and could work freely in the uh, resistance. When I was uh, in the resistance, I made a picture, and this picture is from a giant billboard, a giant billboard which they uh, put up on the wall, and this was uh, advertisement for people to go and see this movie. There's marked on it, The Eternal Jew. You have to come and see this movie. The idea was to get as many collaborators as possible to get along with the Germans. And uh, of course, then this was uh, propaganda to get as many to uh, follow the Nazis. And as a matter of fact, uh, they did get from the Holland people a lot of collaborators because it is known uh, that Holland had per capita uh, compared to other countries the most collaborators. I asked you before and I wonder why do you think that is? Why do you think the, the Dutch people were so willing to act as collaborators? Uh, because of some did it for they uh, could get jobs. Mm -hmm. Uh, they could get uh, extra rations and coupons mm -hmm. and all that uh, stuff. It's... Uh, Economic hardship, you think? Whatever. And not the only thing. And some were very happy to, uh, to jo join uh, this or that, you know. There are people when they are... Uh, there are joiners in, in this world who just join for the, uh, for the sake of joining. And they don't even know what the hell they join for. Mm -hmm. But uh, when they were in the Dutch Nazi uh, organization, they felt that they became some, somebody. They felt like an Ubermensch. They felt as, uh, above and stronger than anybody else. And that's, uh, I think, why they did it. Uh, like I told you about uh, that they made the ghetto in Amsterdam. Uh, these were the signs that went up. And this says, for instance, uh, Judengracht, that means the Jewish canal. Others uh, had, to, because uh, the canal is a canal, and other signs, for instance, had uh, Jewish uh, street or Jewish fertile, Jewish neighborhood. Now, below that sign, you see another little sign, and it is marked, Für Wehrmacht verboten. That means that the military, German military, were not allowed to go in to the ghetto. The Gestapo, the Grüne Polizei, the German military police, and the SS, they were allowed to go in there. No regular military were not allowed to go in there. Okay. And that was in the beginning? That was in the beginning. And is this the corner you were standing in when some of the boys were... 
Uh, um. This is, as a matter of fact, uh, that's a picture that I took with a very old-fashioned box camera. Mm -hmm. And as you notice, I still got the cover hanging down my shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, Jews at that time were not ordered yet to wear a Jewish star. Okay. But this, the signs already were up and Jews were put in a ghetto. From all of Holland, they had to come to the city of Amsterdam, mm -hmm. and that's where they made the ghetto. Okay. And this is in the Waterloo Center area, correct? Okay. Yes. This is the star that I was talking about, that uh, after the ghetto was put up, Jews were ordered to wear the Jewish star. This star had to be sewn onto, sewn on, not with a pin or whatever it is, because if you take a good look at it, you still can see the threads from when it came off uh, the clothes. Uh, this had to be sewn onto your jacket or, or uh, suit or coat on the left side. And if you took off your coat or your jacket, you better have one on your shirt. You were not allowed to walk the street mm -hmm. without this star. If they stopped you on the street, and if you didn't wear it, and if they were suspicious that you were Jewish without a star, they asked you for the ID card. Mm -hmm. And on the ID card, they could see that you were a Jew. You were gone forever, for never to come back. And when these were issued, they came on a whole bolt, bolt no, of cloth, this, right? This, uh, you don't have to do the back mm -hmm. there. Okay. And you cut them out, right? Didn't you tell me that? Yeah, they came in a whole sheet. Mm -hmm. They came in a complete sheet, this wide, mm -hmm. like they were printed like textile, uh, mm -hmm. and that wide, and uh, they were, uh, then you had to cut them out. Okay. These were the signs they, uh, which were uh, put up for Jews forbidden, for Joden forbidden. It means Jews not allowed to go to any of these places, like I told you before, restaurants and primary public places, etc., etc. Jews not allowed. This was, all the stores had to be in the window, and that was it. Whether they liked it or whether they didn't like it, that was it. If they were against the Nazis, but they had to put the sign up. Okay. It was mandatory to do that. I was talking about my fiance, and this is the girl that was my fiance who was she is from a family of eight. I had made a hiding place for her in her parents' home, but uh, her sister with her husband went in there, and when they uh, came for to empty the whole city of uh, Jews and they came into their house. She did not want to go in there. She wanted to stay with her parents. And uh, her sister, who did go in there with her uh, husband, they survived the war. But her and her father, mother, and five brothers and sisters did not survive the war. Can you tell us her name and the family's name? Her family is Henrietta de Leeuw. Um, here is the family uh, that would have been my in-law family, but unfortunately they all got killed. Uh, in the middle on top you see my fiancé. Left and right of her are two sisters. On the bottom, father and mother. And in the left corner, on the bottom, is the sister who did go in the hiding place, who did survive with her husband because they did go in, in the hiding place. If you turn it around, then you see some more brothers and sisters who did not survive. That's a sister, brother, other brother, sister-in-law. They're all gone, 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 gone. For never to come back. Oh, this here is a picture of uh, my fiancé and myself uh, when it was ordered to wear a Jewish star. You cannot see the star on her jacket because my arm is in front of it. But this was in the days that 
you were ordered to wear a star, and that was also in the time that I was in the resistance. This is a picture of the wedding of my fiancé brother. And as you notice, everybody was wearing a star. And what is so... I don't even know how to say that, what is so very bad about the whole situation. Here is a joyous occasion which is so depressed by everybody wearing a star. Even the lady here who is wearing a stole takes off the stole underneath on a dress. She's wearing a star. This was done in the very famous Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam, which is still there today. As a matter of fact, that synagogue was announced by the German as a, a monument to save for later on in life, when there are no Jews left anymore, to tell the people that this was a place where Gentile kids were taken to and killed for, to take the blood which they would use for their Passover. That was the idea. Uh, that synagogue is still standing there and untouched. That synagogue is a beautiful synagogue. As a matter of fact, that synagogue came out completely undamaged, even with the scrolls, the Torahs, the silver and everything, because that uh, synagogue is built over a canal. And what they have done they took all the silver, the bocals and the yacht and the crowns and everything. They put a rowboat underneath the synagogue in that canal and put everything, all the valuables in there. And the synagogue is very high, extremely high, and way on top in the rafters they put all the Torahs. And then later on, the, it's a Portuguese synagogue in the, in the Sephardic. Mm. And when they came back, oh, they were cut down because there was a small Sephardic community compared to the Ashkenazis. They were much smaller. A uh, very small community came back, but all the scrolls were still in there and all the silver still underneath uh, uh, the, the synagogue. Then the German had declared it a national monument that later on they would show to the world. Now, this picture was taken in the synagogue during the uh, wedding ceremony. And all the people you see in the back there, none of them came back. And on the bottom, you see there uh, five uh, ashes, of which one, two died in the concentration camp. Three of them survived the war. Uh, this is a very famous professor, uh, uh, Abram Pais, a very famous man. He, uh, maybe he passed away by now, but he lived in, uh, in Denmark. He's very well known in, uh, in New York, in, in one of these universities. This is a picture of my cousin Solomon Shriver and his wife. As you notice there, on the bride, through the veil that she's wearing there, you can see also the star. It's so depressing on a joyous day, everybody wearing a star. One year after they were married, they got slaughtered in the concentration camp. They were gone. One year after, gone. This is another picture, more close up of Solomon Shriver and his wife and her sister who was the uh, maid of honor. All three of them died, killed in the concentration camp. Here's a picture of my fiance and her sister. And what are their names again? Pardon? What are their names again? Uh, this is Yeti and uh, Rachel de Leo in front of the home where they were living. They had a four-story uh, home there. Here's another picture of... another picture of Rochelle. Look at those beautiful girls. They, they're unbelievable. 
It's, it's, no, it's unbeclumable. It's, it's, well, this is a postcard that was sent from my fiance to me, addressed to me, on which she writes, forget me not, Jetty. She was on vacation with her parents on the beach. If you turn it around, uh, you see the picture. She sent it to my address in Amsterdam, not knowing that a couple of years after, no more. Uh, this was my uh, ID card in Westerbor concentration camp. And as you notice, the S, that's what I was talking about before, that was gestraft, straf, that means punishment. Mm. Uh, if I was uh, stopped by the SS in the concentration camp or whenever I had to show my ID card and they did see the S, then they knew that I was in a punish, uh, uh, punishable object and mm. I did with you whatever they wanted to uh, because I was in the resistance and I was, uh, at, uh, that I was uh, opposing the, the, the camp commander there, uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, so um, an S for stuff. How long were you in the punishment barrack? The entire time? No, the most of the time that I was in the camp. Okay. Only but towards the end I came out. This picture Like I said before, they had left us alone. They didn't uh, do anything to us you, the first nine months, and that we were not allowed later on to uh, go to public places, dancing, part of them, etc. Then we uh, started our own uh, dance halls and this and that. And then the Dutch Nazis came and they tried to disturb us, and then they came to Waterloo Square to beat up the Jews and they got beaten up and now where the German were going to see the Nazis, they were going to show the Dutch Nazis how things are going to be done. On Saturday morning, for nine months we haven't seen a German and Gestapo and SS, and none, never, never in the ghetto, never in the neighborhood and so Everything is fine. Saturday morning you go to school, in the afternoon you congregate on the street with your friends and uh, it's nice, you got your, your Sabbath suit on and your, everybody looks beautiful. But standing on the corner of the street, on my street, Church Street, and in Dutch, Kerkstraat and the Weisperstraat, and a man in a dark leather coat and a black hat comes straight up to me and we're standing there with three, four boys talking and he said to me, Mr. Jude, are you a Jew? And I said, and, and, and I, I didn't expect it. I said, what? And my friend said, I am, what do you want from it? And he took him by the arm and walked him across the street and handed him over to a Grüner Polizei, a German military police. And I look and I see German military police walking there and there and there with Jewish boys. And the guy handed him over to a German, and he turned around and he came for us again. And I said to the other boys, fast, let's go in the street. And we went into my parents' home, we went to the top floor, to the attic, and we're in hiding there. And this went on for two days. They rounded up, for the first time that they rounded up people, 426 or 29 Jewish young men. And they took them first to <coughs> Buchenwald and then to the stone quarries in Mauthausen, where they were in three months completely because 
the treatment was so bad, they had on the bare backs, they had to run with the big stones up and down the quarries. They had to uh, do all kind of hard work without water, food, uh, without anything. It was so bad that they couldn't, some of them couldn't take it no longer. They, they went in, in rows holding hands and jumped down the square where, where, where they fell with their head on the stones, their brains busted out, the blood spreading all over. They just couldn't take it no longer. Some of them were even pushed down by the SS down the quarry. I have that all in writing, I have that. And in three months, all of them got killed. There is only one boy who survived. This fellow with the dark head, dark face, that's my cousin, Herman Shriver. He got killed with these boys. There's another fellow here by the name of Pollock, also a friend of mine. All of them are gone. All of them. All these boys got killed in a very gruesome, gruesome way. They died in a horrible, horrible, horrible situation. Bastards. And that's why I can't, I, I can't understand. I, 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 I can't, I cannot. I cannot digest it, I cannot. I don't want to go into it and then uh, go crazy. Nerve the guts they have. Where, where do they get the nerve to go across the border into a strange country in another country, the German coming across the border into Holland? Where do I get the nerve? And then take the people out of there and, 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 and gas them in, 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 in Where do they get the nerve to do that? What kind of people are they? I don't know. It's, it, I, 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 I have no words for it. You want to know something? You want to know something? Holocaust deniers? If I would, have, would not have experienced what I experienced there, and know the stories today, what happened there, I would doubt too that this may have happened, because it is so gruesome, it's so unbeclumicable, that I would be a denier too. Because it is unbelievable. The Holocaust is unbelievable. And people who are not anti-Semitic, don't get me wrong. Listen, a Holocaust denier, I met him. I met him. When I was speaking at the museums or here or there, Holocaust deniers, I met them, and then, uh, for instance, uh, uh, I got to talk, either they're dumb, stupid, uneducated, or plain anti-Semitic. But if you take that away, somebody who is none of these things could be a Holocaust denier. I may have been one of those, because it is so gruesome, it is so unbeclumicable, that I don't blame an honest Holocaust denier who is not anti-Semitic or stupid or under the case or got those what. I don't know whether you ever had anybody explaining it to you this way. But that's the way I see it. It is unbelievable. Unbelievable not the word, it's just unbeclumicable. It's, anyway, let's go. I wish I could have a one for one in my hands. Uh, this picture is the, how do you call it, uh, the attest from, uh, mm -hmm. from General Allard. Mm -hmm. This is when he was already now a full-fledged uh, general, chief of staff, uh, giving a certification of uh, what has happened. You want me to read it? No, well, this is actually uh, that the, uh, uh, 
Oh, if you want to read it, mm -hmm. go ahead. You, you, you okay. can go ahead if you Gentlemen, want. Gentlemen, during the invasion and liberation of Holland, I held the rank of Brigadier General and was in command of the 6th Brigade, 2nd Division of the Canadian Army. I hereby wish to vouch and verify the following. Before dawn on the morning of the 12th of 1945, one of our patrols took into custody Mr. Sam Shriver, who had just swam across a canal. He told us that he had escaped from the Westerbork concentration camp several hours before. He said that the camp was nearby and housed about a thousand Jewish inmates. To the best of our knowledge, Westerbork was a German military barracks and we were preparing to shell and destroy it. Mr. Shriver explained that indeed German soldiers had recently been housed in, in the, during the, the German retreat. As I was suspicious of Mr. Shriver's story, I sent a six-man patrol accompanied by him to verify. Upon arrival at the camp, they found that everything Mr. Shriver said was true, and the patrol commander sent this information to my command post, and we advised 2nd Division. Indeed, due to the intervention and the action of Mr. Shriver, the total annihilation of the Westerbrock camp and its approximate 1,000 inmates was prevented. Respectfully submitted, Jean-Victor Allard, General, retired, Chief of the Def Defense Staff, 1964 through 1969. This is dated August 15, 1990. And the follow-up letter, also from the same general, says, Gentlemen, referring to my letter of August 15, 1990, I wish to make the following Wait. additional statement. In the above-mentioned oh, no. letter, I described a six-man patrol which accompanied Mr. Sam Shriver to the Westerbork camp. However, in this letter, I omitted to state the fact that this patrol met with stiff resistance from German SS and Dutch collaborators when approaching Westerbork concentration camp. My men eliminated the enemy resistance, and Mr. Shriver, who had been armed by us, fully participated in these activities. Respectfully submitted, Jean-Victor Allard, General Retired, former Chief of De Defense Staff, 1964 to 1969, and the letter is dated October 29th, 1990. This picture is a picture of uh, General Allard and me and his soldiers. On Armistice Day, we used to get together to celebrate the day and to commemorate the lives of the fallen soldiers. And these men behind him, are all these soldiers are men who was fighting with him during the war in Europe. Well, this is when I was uh, knighted uh, by the Queen, and it was done by the Consul General of the Netherlands mm -hmm. uh, by the name of uh, Andre Brouwer. Mm -hmm. He knighted me mm -hmm. on behalf of the Queen of Holland, mm -hmm. for which I received that medal that I uh, showed you before. This is the uh, citation that came with the uh, medal citation that I got from Her Majesty the Queen of Holland, Queen Beatrice. Citation that says, Her Majesty the Queen, the Grand Master of the Order of Orange Nassau, by her decision of April the 14, 2000, Samuel Schreiber, born in Amsterdam, named to member of the Order of the Orange Nassau. These are the uh, uh, coupons uh, for rations that I was talking about uh, that you had to get to buy things. You couldn't go just to the store and just buy it. You had to, uh, to have these. These are the list of my relatives who were taken to either Auschwitz or Sobibor, where they got killed. Uh, as you notice, 
most of them are in 1942 and 43. But like I said before, my cousin who was in that group of people, first very group who got killed, he got killed in 1941. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for it. Herman. 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 Mm -hmm. At and Mauthausen, yeah. In Mauthausen, yeah. Is it marked there? Yeah. Yeah, here. Mm -hmm. Look, in 1941. He was the, among the very first ones. And are the two where you have the question marks people that were not sure what happened to them? Marianne de Jong? Yeah. No, I'm not sure of, uh, of dates or, or so. Okay. Okay. Uh, the previous one that I showed you there was from my father's side, okay. all the relatives. Uh -huh. And these are the relatives who got killed in either Sobibor or Auschwitz from my mother's side. Okay. So I should notice uh, pretty well all my relatives are gone. Mm -hmm. And you were able to get these records how? Uh, there is a book that I have in Montreal that is the memory book. Mm -hmm. And in that book are 102,000 names okay. of all the people who died in the concentration camps. I got a complete book on that. Okay. And uh, that book is not for sale no more. There's a certain uh, amount. Mm. And I was lucky enough to, to get one. And I got it out of that book. Now, uh, it's not hard to get any information to begin with mm -hmm. because the German were so, how do you say that? Having everything on, 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 on mm -hmm. They were very precise in the record keeping. Precise in the mm -hmm. record keeping. Mm -hmm. they, 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 it's unbelievable. If you go to Westerbork concentration camp, mm -hmm. you will see there uh, all the names of all the, the people who were there. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I, I got some here. If you want, I'll, I'll get, you want them? I'll, I'll get mm -hmm. Of all the people who were in Westerbork, uh -huh. They got the information, the name, uh -huh. where they used to live. This is one of those cattle cars, I call it box cars. And when the Jewish people, indeed like cattle, were transported to the death camps in Poland. People were pushed in there, sometimes with as many as 75, 80, or more, standing room only, no food, no water, no bathroom facilities, only one little opening here which was completely closed with barbed wire <coughs> for some ventilation. Uh, I was in there with 80 people, 80, 82, and that was horrible. That was horrible. That was horrible. Uh, like I said before, the stench, the smell, people had to let go. There was one barrel somewhere in the corner, but you couldn't even get to it. It was standing room only. It, babies crying, old people moaning, groaning, and the people dying. You can't get out of there. You can't. You're locked in. It is bolted on the outside. Here is a sliding door, and here the bolt goes on. You can't get out. That's bad. Bad, 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 bad. These are the various batches that people had to wear either in the concentration camps or in the cities or the camps, wherever they were. And for each uh, group or denomination, there was a different uh, star. 
There are different ones for homosexuals, for Jehovah's Witnesses, for Jews. They had them in German, they had them in French, they had them in, uh, in Dutch. That is, for instance, here in French, here it is in German, here it's in Dutch. Zwift, Jude, Jood. You don't know who that, who that is. <laughs> That's my ID card. Get That's my the ID picture card. on your ID card? Get the ID card. Mm -hmm. Somebody enlarged it in the museum, <laughs> I think, did it. Somebody in the 19 years of age. Yeah, I think it's good to see who we're talking about. Hmm? I think it's good to see who we're talking about. I was stuff then. Uh, this is uh, my father in his business. My father was a tobacco merchant, and he's here uh, showing uh, one of his customers the quality of the tobacco. On the left-hand side, you see my father with his bicycle, because that's how business was done. You go with your bicycle, you go around. Right. Okay. And who's this? And this is a picture of my late mother. She was a good woman. She was really a great woman. She, she just loved her kids. She was really a real fine Yiddish mama. Oh yes, a real Yiddish mama. I was uh, honored in 2007 by the Florida Holocaust Museum. They had a uh, money raising uh, raiser there to uh, and. This was a to life dinner, uh, to life, to heroes, to courage, and with four other men, uh, we were honored there at that dinner. It's a nice evening. I brought my whole family in there to be with me, and as you see, this is something I like to tell you, you know, that goes through my head sometimes. Um, uh, I, I, I won over Hitler. Yes. I, I won. Yes. I, 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 I won. And I'll tell you how. Zero. The score is 17-0, like a football match. Zero. He didn't kill me. Right. 17. That's me, my wife, three children, right. three in-law children, nine grandchildren, 17. I won. With all my sores and with all my losses and anything mm -hmm. and everything, I still won. That's right. That's right. So I got the whole family there. And I think you won here too, and that's why I want you to show this last one and say something briefly about who this is and your relationship. <laughs> <laughs> this is a friend of mine. Well, let me tell you how we met. I was a kid of somewhere around 11 or 12 years old, living in Amsterdam. The street was a fairly narrow street. Uh, you could stick your hand out of the window and shake the hand of the people across the street. And uh, I have to be honest, I, was, I won't say the bully, but it was my street. The street belonged to me. Yeah, that was it. Uh, if there was a fight, then uh, I was either there to fight it or to separate it. Uh, it was my street. And all of a sudden, I see a black boy coming down the street. I'd never seen a black person in our neighborhood before. Never seen a black person altogether because you haven't got in Holland. Right now you're a but never ever any and as she was coming i said okay hey hey stop he said but i said turn around back back where you came from he said no i have to go this way i said no back that way no and we got into a fight and we got into a bloody bloody fight and believe me we were going and the guy was pretty strong and they fighting fighting for nobody was winning but we were both bleeding it was a very bad fight. And all of a sudden, we stopped fighting and we look at each other. What are we fighting for and what about? And we both didn't know because he hadn't done anything to me. I did nothing to him. Right. And I realized that for one reason, which is still puzzling me, I was so young. Was it because he was a stranger? never seen him, or because he was black, mm. or, or what was the reason? And I don't know. And I said to him, what are you fighting for? He said, I don't know. 
we became friends and we became good friends. This fellow became very famous in Holland because he became a trumpet player for the biggest band that was in Holland, the Sky Masters was the name. And because he had a, on his lip something double, like, and a trumpet player has here a little lip that he, he could play two trumpets at the same time. This man was so famous, he was such a great guy. He became my best buddy and after the war, we got together again and whenever from Canada where I was living, uh, I went to visit uh, Holland. I went to see Ardo Broadbom because that's his name, Ardo Broadbom. And we were the best of friends. As a matter of fact, I am going to get in touch with him. I hope he's still living. He, he's my age, so, you know, he's getting there too. <laughs> but that's the story of Ardo Broadbom. Fine guy, great guy, great individual. Okay. And I think maybe just the name. That's a good one to go out on, just the name. And I tell that you're talking about name. I tell my grandchildren sometimes. You know your name? Yeah, it's Shriver. So it's not a short name, is it? No, no. It's not a short name like Smith or this or no. It's a long name, yeah. Don't you ever lose one letter of it. And in case they didn't know what I was talking about, I said, keep that name in good order. Keep the name high. Came from a good source. Right. Came from my father. Right. Came from my daddy. Hmm. It's Thank a good you. name. It's a very good name. Thank you, Sam.